In this video, we're going to talk about runtime mesh combination, a hot topic I know, and we're going to see how I use that in my mini golf micro game to reduce ghost collisions, preserve the physics material on the different types of tiles. So sand should be more frictiony than grass, right? And of course, also reduce the number of draw calls, improving the performance of the game. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dream become a reality by helping you combine meshes at runtime, which has a load of benefits for your game. If you've been following along in this tutorial series about how I made all the different aspects in this free and open source mini golf micro game, link in the description, full game on itch, both are free. You'll know that we only have two scenes in the entire game and we can't do a lot of the optimizations we might usually do in the editor. So we have to do it all at runtime. So really we break this down into a relatively simple algorithm. Step one is we spawn in the level from the data that we have in our scriptable object. Step two, while we're spawning them in, we're animating them in so we get a cool level spawn effect. Once all of the animations have finished, then we start the mesh combination process. And this mesh combination process is a little bit tricky because we have different types of terrain. And if you're making a mini golf game, you probably need to do something similar because you're gonna have different types of floor. It's not all just gonna be grass. You may have thick grass, you may have sand, you may have water, etc., And all of those will probably have different physics materials. So what I'm doing is I'm isolating the different objects based on their vertex color and saying this vertex color maps to this physics material. Then I collect all of the tiles in the scene that have that particular vertex color and group all of those together and combine them. And we do that for each vertex color. So in this example, we have grass, sand, and the walls. It's three different vertex colors. They're all using the same material. And that's a really important note is in this game, I'm only using one material, which makes this process very easy. And that was done intentionally. So we'll go through all of those, say, okay, here are all the sand tiles, here are all the grass tiles, here are all the wall tiles, whatever other tiles exist as well. We'll go through and exclude any objects that we've marked as, hey, don't combine this because we have dynamic obstacles like an alligator chomping, something like that, that you have to putt through. You don't want to combine that mesh because then you're going to lose the animation. So I've got like a windmill, for example. I want to exclude that from the runtime combination. So we'll do any filtering like that to exclude those objects, which is done by a tag. And once we've excluded all of those, we're going to use the combine instance, which is the way that we combine meshes and add in all of those meshes that exist there, combine them all together. Then we basically have an array of combined instances, one per tile. I create some new game objects, attach the mesh filter, mesh renderer, and mesh collider to those, attach that physics material to the mesh collider. And then one at a time, we pass this information over to Unity Mesh Simplifier, which is also a free GitHub project. And we tell it to simplify it with the default simplification options and the default quality of one. What this does is removes any duplicate vertices that we have, because in this game, we've got four corners, basically just cubes stacked up next to one another. And wherever those two cubes join, we've got a duplicate vertice. And that's part of where we can get some of those ghost collisions. So by pumping it through Unity Mesh Simplifier, we can remove those duplicate vertices and that eliminates the ghost collisions on that type. And then we only have to worry about the ghost collisions of the ball as it traverses from one type to another type. So like from grass to sand. At that seam, we can potentially get the ghost collision. And if you haven't already checked out my video on how to eliminate that, I've got a link in the description to that as well. We're gonna go through that step by step with all of the code to do each of those things. And if you want to follow along, you can check out the full project on GitHub. It's free. You can check it out, download it, play with it, do whatever you want and see exactly how this works while we're going through it together. Let's get started. In our scene here, you can see that every tile spawns in individually, but later on, we combine these all into a single mesh. So all the sand tiles, all of the green grass tiles, and then separately, the whole are combined into their own mesh. So this mesh is all the grass tiles combined. This one is all the sand tiles combined. And combining the meshes goes a long way to help prevent our ghost collisions, which I recently covered as well. I've got a link in the description to that card on the screen as well. But it doesn't solve the problem completely whenever we transition from one type of mesh to another type as we run into the problems. So if we only had grass, then this actually solves all of the problems. But mini golf with only grass isn't very exciting. So this was one step I took to remove those ghost collisions. And it also helps us with performance because we don't have to render each individual tile individually. We can now render this whole thing in one single batch. In fact, you see we only have a total of 35 draw calls. 
and we can see 17 of those draw calls come from post-processing. Only a handful are actually used to draw the objects. Actually, it draws pretty much all of them in one go. That's because the coloring is handled by vertex colors, so they're all using the same material, which means they can all be drawn together. In the game, I've got a level spawner, and I've covered in a previous video how the level spawner works. Again, link in the description to that. What we're gonna be covering today is the mesh combiner and combine and simplify children. I kind of went back and forth on how to present this, and I think it's most important that we talk about the mesh combine instance and how that works, and I'll just give an overview of how did we use it in this particular micro game. Our entry point into simplifying meshes is using the combine and simplify children. I split this up because it's really a two-part process. Part one, you can see in Simplify, we're going to combine meshes together. Once we've combined the meshes, we're using Unity Mesh Simplifier to simplify that mesh. And really all that's happening here is combining those vertices close enough together that are considered a single vertex. And that eliminates that ghost collision on this mesh. So step one, combine meshes. Step two, simplify those meshes. That's all that this mono behavior is doing. Now our mesh combiner I actually got the initial implementation from David T. I've got the link to the GitHub up here, but I heavily modified what this does. So not all of this is my code. And as you can see, there's a lot of it. So don't forget the full projects on GitHub. You can see this script and the rest of it as well if I'm going too fast or I skip over something that you thought was really important and I didn't explain quite well enough. From Combine and Simplify Children, we call Combine Meshes. Really all we're doing up here is preventing scaling issues. The key part about this is when we're combining the mesh instances, we want them all to be centered around the origin. And if this object has some non-identity rotation, a non-zero position, and a non-one scale, it can mess up our process here. We cache the old values so we can reapply them at the end. You can really avoid having to do this if you just make sure that your object starts at the origin and does not have rotation and has a one 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 scale. Now I needed to be able to exclude some objects from the combination. And I did that if they had the tag exclude from combine. That way, whenever we have dynamic obstacles in our scene, in our level, like the windmill, that windmill is animated. And if we combine the meshes, we'll lose the animation of that windmill going and it becomes a not very fun obstacle. So if we've assigned a tag to some object called exclude from combine, we're going to unparent it. That makes it where now this object will be excluded from the combination because we're gonna combine all objects in the next step that are still here. And we recursively go through all of the children in case some child object is deeply nested and marked as exclude from combine. And you'll notice here, we're actually going backwards over the child count because if you go forward and you're mutating the array by unparenting objects, well, then you start missing items and skipping them. So if you go from the end backwards, it works a little bit better. So once we've removed all of our objects that are dynamic obstacles or should be excluded, then we're gonna combine those meshes. Then when we're gonna do combine meshes, let's walk through the algorithm here because if we try to explain it top down, it gets a little bit confusing. We start by getting all of the mesh filters and group them by the vertex color of that mesh. Remember in this game, all of our meshes are a single vertex color and each one represents a different type of ground. So in this case, this is a grass tile. So it has a particular green vertex color and it has a physics material called grass. The wall is gray and has a different physics material. And we also have like sand, which is some kind of brown color and has a different physics material. With that design in mind, that tells us how we're gonna handle combining the meshes. Per vertex color, we're expecting there to be some set of meshes. And we also expect that per vertex color, we will have some physics material because we wanna retain the physics properties of those combined meshes after we've combined them. So what we're gonna do is find out all our mesh filters. Then we have to create combine instances, one combine instance per mesh. And that's just how we use combine instances. There are not a ton of great documentation on it, but simply put, we want one combine instance per mesh that we wanna combine and we tell it where in the world it is. And then we pipe it into something called mesh.combine meshes. And that handles the rest to create one single mesh based on all the combine instances provided. So that's why we need this total mesh count of combine instances. We're gonna go over this for each loop in a minute in more detail, but simply put here, we are setting up our combined instances based on the meshes provided. Once we've done that, we're gonna to wanna to deactivate all those objects that we just pre-processed. You could also destroy them, but I chose to deactivate them. And then we wanna actually do the mesh combination. So we wanna create a mesh, combine all the grouped meshes together by the vertex color, 
and then create a game object with a mesh collider, mesh renderer, providing back that combined mesh and the physics material based on that vertex color. With that high level overview in mind, let's walk through it with a little bit more detail. In get mesh filters to combine, here we're getting all the mesh filters underneath this current game object. Then using some link soup, we're going to grab all of our mesh filters and group them by the vertex color. Because of what we just talked about, each object only has one vertex color and each one of those will also have a corresponding physics material. Once we've grabbed all of our mesh filters, that function gives us out the total number of meshes that we have and we need one combined instance per mesh. That's why we need the total mesh count. Then we're gonna iterate over this grouping of color to array of mesh filters and go over each mesh filter and set up our mesh combined instance based on that mesh filter. I'm using the sub mesh index to correlate our mesh to a vertex color. So when we combine them later, this is what we're going to use as a differentiating factor in our 1D array here. We could have used something like a dictionary or something of that nature as well. I just chose to use a sub mesh index because that was an unused property for me. Once we've set up our combined instances with our mesh transform and our correlated sub mesh index to vertex color, we sum up our vertex lengths and we set up our physics material here. So if we have not already identified which physics material goes with this particular sub mesh index or this vertex color, we go ahead and add that physics material to this dictionary of int to physics material. And at the bottom, we increment our sub mesh index to say, now we're moving on to a new vertex color and repeat the process. Then we deactivate all of the objects that we just pre-processed and will be combining. We iterate over all of our mesh filter grouping, that's our colors to our mesh filter array. We create a new mesh, which is our new combined mesh, give it a name and make sure we set the index format to be the uint32. That gives us the most number of vertices on this mesh. Not all platforms support the 32-bit indices. So if you're working on a platform that does not support that, you may need to split up these meshes into multiple objects where you have about 65,000 vertices as the cap and use the 16-bit format. Next, we're finding the relevant combined instances based on that sub mesh index. So again, this gives us all of the combined instances that map to this particular vertex color. Once we found them, we're forcing the sub mesh index to be zero because the sub mesh index is used to determine which materials to use. And I only have one material per object, so they need to be on sub mesh index zero. If you use something besides a simple array for your relevant combined instances, such as color to combined instance array, you wouldn't need to do this second step. And once we have all of our combined instances, we're using the magic mesh.combine meshes, which takes all of those combined instances and forces them into one single mesh. This is really the key part about how we combine the meshes. We take our combined instances, shove them together into mesh.combine meshes, and it handles the rest. Once we have combined those meshes, we just make a new game object so we can display this combined mesh, set up a mesh filter, mesh collider, and mesh renderer, providing the shared mesh on each of those, make sure we set up our physics material on that collider. And in my game, all of the objects are using the same material. So I just grabbed the shared material off the first child. In your game, you may need to also, much like we do our physics material, have some kind of dictionary of which material should be applied to which object. Then I just reparent this underneath my tile map and we set our position and rotation all to be zero because they retain their position all of our positions will be offset from 0, 0, 0 in world space. So whenever we're setting up our game object, we want to make sure it is at 0, 0, 0 world space and repeat this for every vertex color that we have. So this is a real world example of how we can combine meshes at runtime using the mesh combine instance. And if we come back to our combine and simplify children, remember that class? That's where we started this whole thing. That calls that combine meshes function. And finally, we will simplify the mesh filter. And I know I've said it before, the Simplify Mesh Filter, we're using Unity Mesh Simplifier, which is a free open source GitHub project. And this thing, when we call Simplify Mesh, based on our simplification options, we'll combine those vertices that are close enough together to be considered a single vertex, and that eliminates the ghost collisions on that particular object. Now, where there's a seam between two different objects, we still have a problem, and I have a different video covering how we solve that problem, but this one made it so we had the problem only on those seams. And once it's simplified the mesh, we just override our mesh and override our mesh collider as well. By the way, I'm using Rider, the best C-sharp IDE made by JetBrains. I've got a link in the description that'll get you 25% off an annual subscription to Rider with code LLAMACADEMY. 
Highly recommend you check this out. I've been using JetBrains products for over 10 years and I just love their IDEs. With all that together, once we click play, let's just let the little animation play. We can see our tile map disables all of those original components and we have three new meshes. Mesh zero in this case is the wall. Mesh one is the grass. Mesh two is the hole. And our windmill is still going because you can see it's labeled with the tag exclude from combine. It's unparented from the grid, so it can still do all of the animation of moving around and our level is more dynamic where we can hit the windmill blades and it's not static. This is one of the most interesting aspects of making this mini golf micro game. I hadn't worked yet a lot with mesh combination at runtime outside just using Unity Mesh Simplifier or HLOD and both of those are more editor tools. So it's really cool to get into the splitting up by the vertex colors, making sure everything was working right with the combined instance, and then making sure that we simplify the mesh to remove those duplicate vertices. I hope you got a lot of value out of going through this as well. And if you did, make sure that you've liked and subscribed. Make sure you share this out with somebody who would also get value out of the video. That helps a tremendous amount. If you've been getting value out of this mini golf micro game tutorial series and you want to show your support, there's a few ways you can do that. You can get yourself some Lom Academy merch right here on YouTube. You can use the affiliate links down in the description. Those give me a small percentage of the purchase price at no additional charge to you. So if you're doing your Unity Asset Store or Humble Bundle shopping, just click through there before you purchase something and that helps me out a ton. But really, the best way to show your support is if you become a YouTube member or a Patreon supporter. Your recurring monthly contribution there helps a tremendous amount and you'll get some cool benefits as well, like getting a shout out at the end of every video, access to a private members exclusive Discord, and starting at the awesome tier, you'll get a voice shout out like Ivan, Ifiabolus, Perry, and Mustafa, and Sneddon. And of course, at the supporter tier, you'll get your name up here at the end of every video and your name in every GitHub repository. Thank you all who are supporting me right now. I appreciate that so much. And I'll see you on the next video.